I should say that we're recording this talk to put online, so if you want to be recorded, um, like this is the sort of the line of sight, so you can sit at the back, um, and also if you ask questions later, then your voice will probably end up online, um, so if you have a problem with that, don't ask questions. Um, today we're delighted to have Dr Hugh Hunt, um, Senior Lecturer at Cambridge and Fellow of Trinity College. Um, he's featured on TV for National Geographic, and more recently trying to escape from the cold it. Trying to escape from Colditz and um, trying to uh, cycle a pedal, well, try to design a pedal to cycle cycled across the Gibraltar Strait. Um, he'll be talking today on spin, um, why boomerangs work, and why top spin is so effective in tennis. So, <coughs> that'll be a good talk. Um, okay. Thank you for coming, Tessa. Thanks very much. Well, I. I thank you. <clears throat> I've, I had various things I could have talked to you about tonight, and. Um, the, the thing that I kind of have uh, been doing a lot of recently um, is uh, um, TV documentary work on um, well, World War II engineering feats like, uh, well, Escape from Colditz, because at the end of the Second World War, they built this uh, glider in Colditz Castle, the prisoners, and, uh, but the war ended before the glider ever flew, so we built the same glider to the same design and actually flew it out of the castle. And we also did a recreation of the Dam Busters raid, the bouncing bomb. And again, that's something which um, was done in World War II, but since then, it's, we've never actually seen it for real. There were no high-speed cameras pointing at the Myrna Dam on that night. And even, even if there were, it would have been dark. So it was uh, an opportunity just to, to, to see the technology. We're currently working on a documentary on Zeppelins, trying to figure out why it was that they were so hard to to shoot down in World War I and why it was they were uh, so effective for just three or four years and then not effective at all. Um, but actually, far more importantly, something else I could have uh, chosen to speak to you about today is on this subject called uh, of geoengineering. Uh, and some of you will know what geoengineering is. It's um, how do we uh, uh, deal with rising CO2 levels um, should we find ways to sequester carbon dioxide in the sea? Or perhaps we should just find ways of cooling the planet down should we um, uh, just have to deal with a, a warming planet? In fact, colleagues here, Don. Uh, Don Granger here, get muddled up with his colleague Dan, but it is Don. Um, works in the, uh, atmospheric physics here, just uh, meters down the road there. Um, and we worked together on uh, trying to see whether the idea of um, putting particles up into the stratosphere to reflect solar radiation is uh, a, a mad idea that's completely mad, or a mad idea perhaps at least worth investigating. Um, so if you want to talk about that afterwards over a beer or something, then I think uh, Don's agreed to join us for that beer. Um, but look, the, the topic I'm going to talk to you about tonight is um, something which has been growing on me for a long, long time um, because I just realised uh, as I was teaching a course on gyroscopic mechanics in Cambridge, I'm from the engineering department, I realised that I just didn't have a clue how gyroscopes worked. I mean, I, I knew about the equations, but I had no gut feel for it. And I realised why I didn't have a gut feel for it is because I, no one even tried to explain how they worked at school. Now, at school, people tried to explain to me the, the Pauli exclusion principle, and they tried to explain Einstein's theory of relativity, and they tried without success, but at least they tried. But I don't think the word gyroscope was ever mentioned at school. And the idea of angular momentum, the idea of spin, when I went to school, none of these things were really... They just weren't there to be discussed. And um, yet, they're around us all the time. And what I want to do is just to show you a few things to do with spin. A lot of you will think, oh, this is trivial, this is boring, I know all this. But actually, I hope I will have something in this talk for all of you, things you haven't seen before. And most importantly, I want you to be ambassadors for this poorly neglected subject, because kids absolutely love it. All you have to do is carry a bouncy ball around in your pocket, and if you, you know, Kids will just be amazed the kinds of things you can show them just with a bouncy ball or just with your mobile phone or various things, as I'll show you along the way. So this is really 
um, an, uh, a, a teaching you outreach talk as much as anything else. So where I'll start is um, with bouncy balls because um, bouncy balls are pretty simple things to um, to play with. Most most kids have got bouncy balls in their in their in their toy box or you know they they've certainly encountered them and. We tend rather nonchalantly to talk about bouncy balls in physics uh, when we talk about the particle theory of light. Now, whether we like it or not, we, we kind of think of particles as, well, we know how particles work, and we assume that kids out there know how particles work. And unfortunately, most people think of particles as being like this. Well, let's test the particle theory of light. What I've got is um, a couple of mirrors, OK? I'll point to this screen here, but you may prefer to watch that one, I'm, but I'm going to point to this one. Uh, imagine this, this greeny thing up here is a mirror, and this is a mirror, and this is a light beam, particle theory of light, wave theory of light as well, but particle theory of light would predict a path like this. And so I'm now going to do the experiment. I have, this is the top mirror, and it's a table, and this is the bottom mirror, it's another table, and I'm going to take my bouncy ball, this one here, and I'm going to throw it in under here, and it's going to go bounce, 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 and out the other side, OK? Now, it's a very predictable experiment, which is why I have to make it harder for myself <laughs> by putting a target, because that's the way it works. So there's a little gap here, OK? And if you line everything up straight, you can get this thing to work. going on. The ball is doing this. It's going bounce, bounce, bounce. You can hear the... I'm going to move these glasses because they will break if, I'm, if I leave them never too long. Um, you can hear the three bounces if you listen. You can hear the three bounces, but I don't. Three bounces, but it's coming back to me. I'm not spinning the thing and it's, and it's not, nothing to do with the magnetic field of the earth or anything silly like that. It's just the way it works. Why? And why haven't, most of you probably haven't ever seen this before, or if you have, you haven't even bothered to ask the question of why. But it's so simple. It's a dead cheap experiment. You can do it under any bloody table you like. I'm just going to do this one here. I'll just put it under there. It, it works on carpet as well. What we have to do is we've got to get people thinking straight away uh, about spin. Just about every fun thing in life well, maybe, uh, has something to do with spin, uh, certainly in sports. And spin, we've got to understand it. OK, let's have a good look. And this is great fun to explain to kids, because if they're at all interested in science, even vaguely, they will be really interested, and they'll get this straight away. And it's good for teaching the scientific method, too. Because if you're doing science, you have to, do, you have to break the problem down into the smallest possible unit. And now there are three bounces. Well, let's look at each bounce one at a time. The first bounce, well, the ball goes in and the ball starts to spin. Well, why does it start to spin? Well, you could just say, well, it must, why wouldn't it start to spin? You imagine the plane coming into land and, and the wheels on the plane, they hit the runway. Well, just by touching the runway, the, the, the wheel's going to start spinning. If the wheels didn't start spinning, you'd think there's something wrong, the brakes are on or something. So why shouldn't the ball do the same thing? Well, the ball does do the same thing. You take this ball and it starts to spin. You can see that starts to spin, yeah? Okay? That's easy enough, okay? He's going to catch this for me. You'll see that the ball is spinning. Okay, did you see the ball spinning? Okay, there we go. Right, anyway, the ball... You're a New Zealander, you can't throw it. Um, <laughs> and I'm an Australian, I can't catch. Um, so the ball starts spinning. But what does it do next? Well, the thing you have to do is to think whether this is top spin or back spin. So hands up who thinks this is top spin. Right, let's participate. Hands up who thinks it's back spin. Come on, you, the rest of you must know. Okay. Hands up who thinks it's top spin. Hands up who thinks it's back spin. Must be one of you. Because it's back spin. There you go. Was that hand up? Was just, just. <laughs> it's back spin. Why is it back spin? 
Well, you've got to think about where it's going to go next. So let's tip it upside down. Right, now, is this top spin or back spin? Okay, because you've got to think about where it's heading next. In terms of the, the, this table here, it's going to be going to, it's backspin. Now, think about that. If I now have this ball spinning like this, backspin, comes back towards me. Okay, and that is quite cute. But the next thing that's really cute, and it doesn't take much to observe, just look at the ball after you do this spin. Spin direct, so spin direction reverses. Have a look at that spin direction reverses. Okay. Now, uh, so far this experiment has cost me well, this is sort of one pound fifty in the shop. I've I've now worked this all out. Now, the ball comes in, starts to spin, back spin, spin reverses. Now it's top spin, and out it goes that way. I've done no real hard experiments, but I've used my brain, and I now realise what's going on. And I can now perhaps program it up. In, uh, this is just programmed up in MATLAB. And if anyone uses MATLAB, you'll realize just how easy it is to do this kind of thing. It's just using very simple laws, conservation of energy and conservation of angular momentum, and applying those laws at the three collisions. So lo and behold, it does what the, the little experiments did. You know, notice it starts to spin, spin direction reverses, all of that. And then what you can do is you can do a, a high speed video and that's one of these balls that here just videoed up and it does the same bloody thing and you think well this is really good and I can teach a lot of science on the back of this nice simple experiment and I can get kids excited and I can you know they can do these experiments and then I can say well do you remember that Frank Lampard's disallowed goal <laughs> well it's the same thing because what happened was that this ball went in, hit the crossbar, went in actually across the goal line, but it came out again. And it's all to do with spin. And you might think, oh, you know, no one's going to be interested in that. Well, in which case, let's forget teaching science to kids at all, at all. Why don't we get this kind of stuff into their minds while, while they do things they enjoy doing, and football happens to be one of them. Now, we could start even earlier because spinning tops, I don't know, spinning tops is something that kids were given when they're about three, uh, before they're given the bouncy balls because they might choke on them. And um, so I've got a spinning top here. One of the things about a spinning top is, well, they stay up, but only when they're spinning, of course. But what, one thing that's interesting is that they have to be spinning fast enough Nice musical spinning top, but there we go. <laughs> the question that you may well have asked, if you decided to ask, to your mums and dads or uncles and aunts or to your teacher, why does this spinning top stay up? <laughs> Chances are you, you, that you wouldn't have asked the question because you would have, even if you're reasonably smart, you would know, what, you'd know already that this is the one of those questions that if you ask the question, the answer would be, oh, it's too complicated, or, or someone would just make up an answer. I'd say it's something to do with anti-gravity or something like that. But, <laughs> but the thing is that it is considered to be too complicated. Um, if anyone's got a nice answer that they might give to an eight-year-old, which doesn't involve solving the, the, the three-dimensional equations of motion, um, then that's fine, but I think the simplest answer is the honest one. Uh, think, think about a, a question like, um, look, you know, both of my parents are tall and red-headed, and I'm tall and red-headed. How come, how does this work? And then the answer might be, well, it's to do with genetics, or DNA, or uh, chromosomes. Well, doesn't matter which words you use, there are words in the English language which means you can, go you can Google, if you just Google red-headed mother, you probably get a, nothing to do with genetics. But if you Google um, chromosomes or DNA, you probably get a Wikipedia entry which you can find out about. So what word are you going to Google when it comes to spinning tops? Well, if you Google spinning tops, you'll get all the prices at Argos and, and you can, uh, what colour you can buy them in. 
Um, it's really important that we use the right words. The other thing that's really important is that we think of, OK, well, DNA affects human beings and cows and sheep in a certain way because we're all mammals. And it affects insects in a different way and fish in a different way. We divide things up into categories. Well, let's look at the category of spinning things. I can take another spinning thing, say this wheel, and I notice that this wheel doesn't stay up on its own. And in fact, if it's spinning slowly, it doesn't stay up. But if it's spinning fast enough, and if I do it straight, if it's spinning fast enough, then of course it does stay up. Now, maybe there's something that the spinning top and the bike wheel have in common, in which case, Let's talk about it and let's, let's put it in school syllabuses. Because the really neat thing is that if you then do an experiment on one thing, like you might do experiments on, a, on cows or sheep, and then you say, well, actually, in doing those observations, those experiments, I learned something about humans. Well, let's do an experiment with the bike wheel. And most of you will have seen this, but it's always good fun to do it. Because it's a nice, cheap experiment, you get a BMX bike stunt peg, and you put it on with a piece of string, and you say, well, look, I can do this experiment with the bike wheel. And all the kids go, ooh, ah. But the thing is, most kids have never, don't get the opportunity to see this. But they see this and they think, wow, you know, magician. So, well, no, it's not magic. You can do this yourself. And what's more, now that we know that it works with the bike wheel, maybe it'll work with the spinning top. And again, a piece of string is not very expensive. And the same thing happens with the spinning top. And I don't understand why it is that the spinning top doesn't come with the little piece of string attached, with the little instructions on how to do the experiment, because I think people would quite like these to see these things. <laughs> but somehow, it's too complicated. And it's too complicated because we're not willing to use the G word. <laughs> why won't we give it a name and talk about it in primary schools in the same way as we're happy to talk about genetics, chromosomes, DNA, and have these terms bandied around. Any piece of technology, any piece of science, is meaningless unless you can use the language. And this is part of the language. And it's, it's funny to think that uh, the laws of mechanics go back to Isaac Newton. And um, uh, it's interesting, this slide in itself is quite challenging for for, um, for kids at school, and I always like to, uh, to, to impress on, on, uh, on people that, th that this was written in Latin, and that's all written in Latin. The, the Principia is written in Latin, um, and here we are trying to get kids to understand uh, maths and physics and science, even if it's written in English. Um, and they also used, love to use, uh, uh, oh, that's, that's to say that Isaac Newton was from Trinity College, Cambridge, which is, uh, which is neat. Uh, so it's quite fun. I, uh, my, my room in Trinity is just, just around the uh, great court from where Newton had his observatory, which is fun. Uh, then, of course, we're, um, we have Roman numerals. And I also think it's quite good. I, I think it's a shame that Roman numerals aren't really taught in school these days, because at least it gets kids to, to add up. And so I do a sort of quick challenge to see who can get work these things out. But the thing about... Um, Isaac Newton and, and when he lived, is it's not all that long ago. And yet, we seem to have a really short memory. All the things that have happened in mechanics. Newton's laws of motion, we've evolved them, we know so much about them, and we pretty much decided to forget all about them. Oh, no, judging by the little experiments I've shown you so far. Yet, we keep history, Roman history, we will try and remember as much as we can about Roman history, but we kind of forget about all this kind of stuff. Um, the, the, the important thing that I think is good in, uh, when you're talking to young people is to say, look, the, possibly the only thing of Newton's, Newton that you might know is F equals MA. That's the kind of thing that people come out of, out of school with. And the nice thing is that because it's an equation, uh, this equals sign means that what's on the left is equal to what's on the right, which means that if you're accelerating a heavy car, you need a big force. And if you're accelerating a light bicycle, you need the same force, for the, a small force for the same acceleration. But what I like to um, make sure that people are content with 
And you guys all are, but I just feel as if um, the, the demonstrations we have to do to make sure that everybody is content. Uh, it's important that we know the right demos. And again, cheapness is what it comes down to. This is just a, a tube and a string and a tennis ball. And this has got two kilograms of water in it. I can demonstrate this uh, centrifugal force um, by picking up my two litre bottle of water. And again, actually seeing it makes a big difference. Okay, Now, people don't like to talk about centrifugal force. And physics teachers are their own worst enemy because just like the gyroscopic effect, you can't explain uh, spinning tops and, and the, the bike wheel demo if you're not prepared to use the word gyroscopic effect. I'm not sure how you explain this easily to kids without using the word centrifugal force. I mean, you could say, look, I'm whizzing around this roundabout really fast and you get, you get pushed out towards the door because of... Well, you know, you could contrive a sentence that doesn't use the word centrifugal force, or you could just say centrifugal force. And, there's, and you could then begin to use it. And I don't understand why we have to make such a mess of the language by saying there's no such thing as centrifugal force and therefore making it really hard to explain things. And incidentally, I don't understand, as far as I know from Einstein's relativity, it's not possible to distinguish gravity from acceleration. Is that right? I think that's right. I mean, I know that if I have an accelerometer, which measures acceleration, if I tip it upside down, my accelerometer reading is 2G because it just, G, G is registered uh, twice. One, you know, it's G downwards and then it's G upwards. Uh, it's not possible to distinguish acceleration from gravity. And if you then say, if you put an accelerometer on the end of this ball, which direction would it measure the acceleration? Well, it'll measure the acceleration inwards, but there's a force outwards. Now, likewise, we're sitting here. The force we feel is downwards is because the equivalent apparent acceleration is upwards. Now, I would then like to think, well, gravity force, acceleration, centrifugal force are all got to be bundled in together. And I then start thinking, well, if there's no such thing as centrifugal force, there's no such thing as gravity force. So get rid of G, and then say, oh no, of course there's gravity. We can see it, we can feel it. So, well, that's interesting. I don't see anything between this thing of water and the Earth. Can you please explain to me exactly what gravity is? And um, you get into a real philosophical debate. So let's just stick with being able to use gravity force and be able to use centrifugal force, and then we can just use sensible sentences. Anyway, that's a a bit of a rant on centrifugal force, I get, I get cross because physics teachers seem to think they have ownership of the idea that there's no such thing. Anyway, what I really wanted to talk about was vectors. Because you can't, there's a lot of things you can't really explain easily unless you're prepared to use vectors. F equals ma. If there's no force, there's no acceleration. Now, we just saw with the ball going around uh, uh, with the, uh, the bottle, there's clearly a force and therefore there must be an acceleration. Now how do you persuade somebody that there's an acceleration if the speed of the ball going around and around is constant? People use the idea that speed is constant, therefore no acceleration. And I think it's really important to get absolutely comfortable <coughs> with vectors, but kids don't like vectors. They don't like the word vectors. And I just call them arrows. And if you can just have in your back pocket, whenever you're you know, visiting your friends, just have some arrows. They're really handy. <laughs> and then you can say, well, look, if this is my speed, and it's in that direction, and then along comes a force in that direction, it's going to make me go faster. Okay? Because I'm just, acceleration is change of speed. You just add these arrows together. Okay? That's simple. Um, and then if, but if the force is not directly behind me, but if it's at right angles, then I'm happily going along like this, and then there's a force at right angles, so you add the arrow on, 
and I get a new direction because you're adding the arrows at right angles. And kids understand arrows and adding them up, I and mean, they're not dumb. And, um, and they think, well, you know, you, you can have a force at right angles. It doesn't change your speed. It changes the direction of the speed, and that's why you go around in a circle. And eight-year-olds are really happy with this. And, um, but the minute you talk, talk, call them vectors, they just switch off. And I just think we have to be uh, careful if there already exists a word like in schools are now Where I begin to just think this is this world we live in 